Hello everybody, this is Dr. Nadeem and we are with Neelam Path Lectures, the Pursue series. And as you are aware, all our lectures are available on YouTube. You can easily view them and download them at your convenience. We also have a Telegram group whereupon you can join the group and where you can access all the lecture related information. We also have a Google Drive whereupon you can view as well as download all the PDF of lectures and there is a master integration key which helps you in navigating between the Google Drive, the PDFs as well as the YouTube. These are the disclaimers and we are with phase 3 which is recorded pathology lectures which is convenient for the teachers, the students as well as for the organizers. And today we have Pursue 16E which is Hematology Disorders of WBC series and we are streaming from Redcliffe Lab Chandigarh and to talk on this topic we have Dr. Harpreet Virk. She is an MD Pathology from PGI Chandigarh, DM Hematopathology from PGI Chandigarh. Presently she is a consultant pathologist as well as the lab head at the Redcliffe Lab Chandigarh. Her areas of interest being flow cytometry, automated hematology analyzers, coagulation and hemostasis and she's got multiple publications in national and international journals. So I would request Dr. Harpreet Virk to start today's topic which is on Gaucher's disease and related lysosomal storage diseases. So Dr. Harpreet Virk, all yours, please start the lecture. Thank you so much. Hello everyone. So today I'll be dealing with Gaucher's disease and related lysosomal storage disorders. So storage disorders are errors of metabolism with catabolism defects and visible storage material accumulation. Broadly, the storage diseases are divided as lysosomal, peroxisomal or non-lysosomal. So today we'll be dealing with lysosomal storage disorders. So lysosomes are ubiquitous organelles required to metabolize macromolecules. In addition to the hydrolytic enzymes, there are several membrane embedded transport proteins, ion pumps and other specialized components which are important integral part of these lysosomes. So whenever there is any sort of defect in any of these components, be it these hydrolytic enzymes or other uh, membrane components like ion pumps or transport proteins, we have different sort, different kinds of uh, lysosomal storage disorder. Dr. Hers was the first person to describe in early 1960s something called abnormally shaped and large lysosomes in a patient with alpha glucosidase deficiency which later was discovered as Pompe's disease. So Pompe's disease was in fact the first lysosomal storage disorder that was ever described. Since then, the lysosomal storage disorder comprises of a group of around 70 monogenic disorders which are described as disorders of lysosomal catabolism, most of which are inherited as autosomal recessive traits there are three lysosomal storage disorder, which are Hunter's disease, Fabry's So lysosomal storage disorders have been uh, broadly categorized into various subgroups comprises of sphingolipidosis, lipid storage diseases, mucopolysaccharidosis, post-translational modification defects, glycoproteinases, integral membrane protein disorders and others. So uh, as a group, lysosomal storage disorders are uh, relatively common with an incidence of 1 in 5000 to 1 in 5500. However, if you see individual lysosomal storage disorders, they are rare and uh, they have an incidence ranging from 1 in 50,000 to 1 in 250,000 live birth. The most common lysosomal storage disorders are the Fabry's disease the Gaucher's disease, metachromatic leukodystrophy and Pompe's disease. 
both ethnicity and geography uh, play a very important part in the epidemiology of the lysosomal storage disorder. Uh, as you can see in this particular table, the lysosomal storage disorders are relatively more common in Ashkenazi Jews and other uh, subpopulations. So, the geography and ethnicity play a very important uh, role and it's very important to elucidate that in a history whenever a patient comes, uh, uh, whenever a patient presents. So lysosomes are formed through fusion of enzyme containing vesicles produced in the trans Golgi network with other vesicles such as endosomes and uh, autophagosomes. Majority of the lysosomal storage disorders results from mutation in the genes which are encoded by the individual lysosomal enzymes present in the lumen. Uh, but there are certain number of uh, diseases which results from mutation uh, encoding from the genes uh, which, uh, which encodes the defective transport proteins present in the lysosomal membranes. So uh, uh, these transport proteins uh, are depicted as transporters, ion channels, traffic and fusion proteins, they are also an important uh, pathophysiological uh, disease uh, causing uh, uh, entities. Uh, so it's just not the hydrolytic enzymes which are involved in the in the pathogenesis of the of the lysosomal storage disorder, but also the transport proteins in a small subset of uh, cases. So coming to the first uh, lysosomal storage disorder, the Gaucher's disease. So Gaucher uh, disease was first described by Dr. Philip uh, Gaucher in 1882 in a patient with massive, leuke uh, massive splenomegaly without leukemia. He was a French dermatologist and in 1882, while still uh, being a student, he discovered the disease in a 32-year-old woman who had a massively enlarged spleen but there was no evidence of any hematological malignancy. At that time, Gaucher thought that it could be a form of splenetic cancer and he published that in his PhD thesis, uh, 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 in the PhD thesis as a splenetic cancer rather than a storage disorder. Uh, Gaucher's disease is a rare autosomal recessive genetic disease caused by mutation in GBA1 gene which is located on chromosome number 1. So uh, due to this mutation there is markedly decreased activity of lysosomal enzyme glucocerebrosidase which is also called as glucosyl ceramidase or acid glucosidase which hydrolyzes the glucosyl ceramide into ceramide and glucose. So this is the one mechanism uh, by which the Gaucher's disease present that is the deficiency of this enzyme glucocerebrosidase. One rare sub-entity of uh, this Gaucher's disease is because of deficiencies of something called saposin C. So now saposin C is an activator of this glucocerebrosidase enzyme. So whenever there is deficiency of this saposin C, the glucocerebrosidase, although being in a normal amount, will not function properly and hence there won't be any catalytic uh, degradation of this glucosyl ceramide leads to its accumulation in the cells. The disease incidence is around 1 in 40,000 to 1 in 60,000 live births in a general population. But as I mentioned earlier, in certain uh, subpopulations, these diseases are relatively commoner um, and that goes with Gaucher's disease as well. They are more common in Ashkenazi Jewish population. So I'll be dealing with certain components of uh, Gaucher's disease pathophysiology starting with uh, the very obvious thing that is the glucosal ceramide accumulation which is the substrate of glucocerebrosidase enzyme. So whenever there is mutation in GBA1 gene, uh, 
which leads to a decrease in the glucoserbosidase activity and that leads to accumulation of this glucosal ceramide substrate. Uh, this glucosal ceramide gets accumulated in the macrophages and now why it, it gets accumulated in the macrophages because monocyte macrophage lineage is uh, have a very higher amounts of uh, uh, some substrates which is, gly uh, which is called glycosphingolipids. So glycosphingolipids which are ultimately a source of uh, a glucosal ceramide and glucosal ceramide is ultimately the substrate of this glucocerebrositis enzyme which is ultimately uh, defective in, in these cautious disease. So there is relative, uh, so just uh, to emphasize this point, there is relative uh, predominance of, of this glucosal sphingolipids inside the monocyte macrophages lineage cells and hence um, these cells are particularly more affected uh, in the disease process. These Gaucher cells which, uh, which are just the uh, altered macrophages with the accumulated uh, glucosal ceramide, they preferentially infiltrate the bone marrow, uh, the spleen, the liver, that is the hematopoietic uh, system and they, but they can uh, uh, infiltrate other organs as well. So this is a panel of photographs showing uh, the something called Gaucher cells which is characterized by uh, enlarged cell with eccentrically placed nuclei, condensed chromatin and cytoplasm containing of heterogeneous crumpled tissue paper that is the term that is used. So crumpled tissue paper uh, appearance and this crumpling is due to presence of aggregates of glucosal ceramide in a twisted fibrillar arrangement. So this twisted fibrillar arrangement is uh, appreciated in the uh, electron microscopy picture. So these are nothing but accumulated glucosal ceramides. Another component of pathophysiology of cautious disease is uh, something called uh, accumulation of a subpopulation of cautious cells. So recent observation indicate that Gaucher cells do not, uh, do not only result from the transformation of macrophage cells, but they correspond to a distinct M2 subpopulation, which is termed as anti-inflammatory alternatively activated macrophages from an alternative differentiation pathway. So this M2 subpopulation is uh, defined as an anti-inflammatory immunomodulatory and tissue repair, uh, uh, tissue repair uh, subpopulation involved in tissue repair and uh, although there are numerous cytokines, chemokines and other molecules which are uh, present in increased amount in Gaucher, uh, Gaucher patients plasma, there are only certain uh, of these cytokines which are expressed by the Gaucher cells themselves. Um, and the, these particular cytokines are mainly present in the M2 subtype of the macrophage subpopulation. So uh, these, uh, these chemokines are Sheetotriosidase, CCL18 and CD163. And these also serve as a specific disease biomarkers on follow-up that I'll discuss uh, in the later slides. Another component of pathophysiology is the metabolic consequences uh, which are seen other than the accumulation of the substrate. So glucosal ceramide uh, uh, is not only the substrate for glucosal cerebrosidase but it's, it is also an, a substrate of alternative pathway uh, which transforms this glucosal ceramide into glucosal sphingosin. So now glucosal sphingosin is metabolized further into sphingosin and sphingosin 1 phosphate by another enzyme uh, which is uh, something in the line of uh, glucosal cerebrosidase but it uh, is active on the neutral pH and it is uh, encoded by GBA2G. So the classical um, uh, the classical gene which is involved in the Gaucher's disease is GBA1 gene. 
So GBA2 gene is something involved in the alternative degradation of glucosal, uh, glucosal ceramide and this alternative pathway gets more activated once the GBA1 uh, enzyme, the classical enzyme is defective. So this is the photograph uh, just to highlight that since this gluco, glucosyrosidase is uh, defective in the classical case of glucosal uh, or a classical case of Gaucher's disease, the alternate pathway gets activated and it leads to accumulation of this glucosal sphingosin and further accumulation of this sphingosin and sphingosin 1 phosphate. So what now what happens when there is accumulation of this glucosal, uh, there is a production of this glucosal sphingosin and sphingosin 1 phosphate. So this sphingosin is particularly toxic to bone and it causes uh, neuronal dysfunction and death. And uh, they have been, there have been studies which show uh, that glucosal sphingosin could represent a more specific and sensitive biomarker than the conventional biomarkers like CCL18 and sheetotriosidases. So it's just, uh, it is just not the accumulation and leading to cell death and uh, uh, the substrate accumulation and cell eventual cell death. It is also due to production of some alternatively produced components like sphingosin which is directly toxic to the uh, internal organs particularly the bones. Uh, so another component of Gaucher's disease pathophysiology is uh, abnormalities in the intracellular trafficking of glucocerebrosidase. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the enzymatic defi uh, deficit of uh, glucocerebrosidase is not just because of the enzyme dysfunction, but there can be uh, abnormality in the transport of a, uh, suppose a normal enzyme. So there is some defect in the transport of that normal enzyme and hence that normal enzyme is not able to reach uh, the lysosomes and is not able to uh, do its uh, 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 to do its job that is to degrade the substrate and hence the substrate starts get uh, start getting accumulated. So this transport protein most importantly is uh, the LIMP2. This is the LIMP2 protein. So any defect in this LIMP2 protein can lead to uh, defective transport of the normal glucocerebrosidase enzyme uh, into the lysosome. So there has been uh, some relationship has been defined between the GBA1 gene mutation and the Parkinson's disease. Patients with certain kind of uh, certain uh, defined heterozygous or homozygous mutations in the GBA1 gene are considered to be at risk of Parkinson's disease. And why is it so? Because the loss of the glucocerebrosidase function um, also compromises the degradation of alpha synuclein which starts, which starts accumulating within uh, the lysosomes and this uh, directly influences the amyloid formation and aggregation to form the Lewy bodies which are particularly common in the Parkinson's disease. Some relationship has also been found uh, between uh, the uh, glucocerebrosidase deficiency and neoplasia. The uh, frequency of hypergamma globulinemia and presence of monoclonal IgG uh, proteins in Gaucher's disease are two factors which promotes the emergence of multiple myeloma. Uh, there is also increased uh, risk of uh, lymphomas and solid cancers like hepatocellular carcinoma, melanoma and pancreatic cancers but it is less common. The solid cancers are, are relatively less common than the hematological cancers. The pathophysiology of cancer development in Gaucher's disease is not well understood. At least two types of mechanisms may be operating, both of them relating to the uh, glucocerebrosidase deficiency and ensuing catabolic defect, that is the accumulation of the glucosal ceramide or its deacetylated product. 
So, uh, Gaucher's disease uh, is uh, categorized into three subtypes and I have uh, put this picture just to give you a, a pictorial uh, representation that uh, so uh, that the neurological manifestations are uh, particularly more commoner as we go from type 1 through type 3 to type 2, uh, which is type 2, which is incidentally the most uh, uh, serious among all the subtypes. The type 1 is the relatively uh, safer uh, subtype. Uh, majority of the patients can be uh, asymptomatic until very uh, later stage and uh, neurological manifestations are relatively less common in type 1 compared to type 3 and type 2. So coming to the type 1 Gaucher's disease, type 1 uh, is a more it's the most common subtype and there are a relatively absence of neurological impairment and clinical manifestation are a continuum and they are highly variable. Uh, ranging from asymptomatic throughout the life to early onset forms presenting in the childhood. So they may present with uh, multi-system involvement comprising of pathological fractures, hepatosplenomegaly, bone pain, bone crisis, splenomegaly, thrombocytopenia, anemia, osteonecrosis, bone marrow infiltration and osteopenia and they can present at any of the age and the disease presentation in type 1 is highly variable. The middle, uh, uh, se uh, severity wise, the middle is type 3, type 2 is the most severe, uh, type 1 is uh, the most uh, uh, safer uh, subtype and type 3 comes in between. This is also called the juvenile or subacute neurological Gaucher's disease. It exhibits the visceral manifestation described in Gaucher's disease subtype 1 combined with some oculomotor or neurological involvement which appears before 20 years of age in most cases. Oculomotor and neurological manifestations are in the form of horizontal ophthalmoplegia, progressive myoclonus epilepsy, cere cerebellar ataxia or spasticity and dementia. So type 2 is the most severe one. It is also uh, Fortunately, the most uh, rare of all the subtypes, it, uh, it is characterized by early and severe neurological impairment uh, starting uh, in the infants aged three to six months old with systemic involvement later on and uh, along with hepatosplenum again. The, it is characterized by a triad consisting of rigidity of the neck and trunk, which is called a fistotonus bulbar signs and oculomotor paralysis. Apnea related to increasingly frequent and lengthy laryngeal spasm occurs after a few months. The important thing to note is that there is no bone involvement in type 2 uh, Gaucher's disease which is commoner in type 1 and also can be seen in type 3 but it is not seen in type 2 Gaucher's disease. It is usually fatal. The death occurs before the third year of life following massive aspiration or after a prolonged apnea. There is a subtype of Gaucher's disease called fetal Gaucher's disease which is very rare and it is also the most severe form. It usually manifests with hydrops fetalis, hepatosplenum gelli, ichthyosis, arthrogryposis, facial dysmorphia and fetal thrombocytopenia. And usually the death uh, occurs in utero or soon after. So this is a summary slide to just to uh, categorize different types of uh, Gaucher's disease. The type 1 which is a chronic non-neuronopathic form. Type 2 is the acute neuronopathic form and type 3 is the middle of the two which is the subacute but still have uh, some uh, neurological dysfunction. So important thing to note here is that the skeletal disease is not seen in type 2 uh, Gaucher's disease. The CNS is not seen in type 1 Gaucher's disease. Uh, type 2 is very fatal. The death occurs usually less than two years. And uh, the other type 1 and type 3 are relatively milder forms. Uh, type 1 have a, a lifespan typically corresponding to the normal 
uh, lifespan, whereas type 3 has 2 to 60 years of uh, lifespan. So coming to the diagnosis of Gaucher's disease, the diagnosis is usually made by uh, analyzing the activity of the glucosebrosides enzyme. Um, the, um, the, this enzyme activity is usually seen in leukocytes or mononuclear cells or cultured fibroblast. The residual enzyme activity is approximately 10 to 15 percent of the normal values in these patients. Dried blood spots can also be used for the enzyme uh, enzymatic activity and flow cytometry analysis of the of the blood monocytes for all the expression of the of those chemokines and cytokines can be uh, can also be used. The saposin C deficiency is important and I'm highlighting this point again. So whenever uh, we have a patient who is clinically fitting into the Gaucher's disease, but if we look into the enzyme activity and we have the normal uh, glucosebrosides enzyme activity, always uh, rule out the saposin C deficiency, which is an activator of this particular enzyme, which is involved in a subset of these Gaucher's disease. So uh, this is uh, basically a panel of photographs showing the reticular endothelial organs predominantly involved uh, in the disease process. There is accumulation of these Gaucher cells in the liver, spleen and in the bone marrow. And in the bones, uh, there is something called Aaron Mayer's flask deformity, which is being described. The CNS uh, involvement is uh, seen mainly in type 2 and type 3 Gaucher's disease and the Gaucher cells tend to get accumulated in the perivascular location. There is a term uh, which is called pseudo Gaucher cells. Uh, the pseudo Gaucher cells are observed in uh, certain blood disorders or infectious disease like multiple myeloma or uh, with histocytic accumulation of immunoglobulin crystals, Waldenstrom's uh, macroglobulinemia, lymphomas, uh, basically any disease with, with a very high uh, cell turnover. They have similar appearances uh, like a crumpled tissue paper. This is one of the photographs taken from a case of CML um, showing these kind of pseudo, pseudo Gaucher cells. So uh, another aspect of diagnosis of Gaucher's disease is uh, categorizing the, uh, these particular mutations, that is the GBA1 mutation. More than 400 mutations have been described, but there are some mutations which are more common, which I have mentioned uh, here. So the prenatal diagnosis of Gaucher's disease can be performed using these analysis of these mutations, but uh, only if uh, we know the mutation subtype of the index case uh, uh, has been previously uh, categorized. The other uh, uh, abnormalities which can be seen in a patient of Gaucher's disease uh, in, a, uh, in the workup is uh, presence of thrombocytopenia, uh, which is seen in 90% of the cases, followed by anemia. So anemia and thrombocytopenia are mainly due to bone marrow infiltration and splenic sequestration. Uh, they can also be seen as a direct impact of enzyme deficiency on the immature hematopoietic cells in the bone marrow. Uh, apart from that, there can be coagulation abnormalities like uh, uh, prolonged uh, prothrombin time and activated partial thromboplastin time and uh, these coagulation abnormalities are mainly due to liver failure or may be associated with uh, acquired von Willebrand syndrome in some cases. There can be uh, uh, increased, uh, uh, increased expression of chytotriosidase, CCL18 and glucosal sphingosin and ferritin uh, which are considered as a biomarkers of the disease. These are important not only for the diagnosis, but also for the follow-up. Apart from that, the routine liver function tests, the CRP, autoantibodies like antinuclear, antiphospholipid antibodies can be utilized. The abdominal and bone marrow, uh, sorry, the abdominal and the bone MRI and bone densitometry are also uh, components of uh, the, uh, the workup of the Gaucher's disease. There are two specific types of treatment for Gaucher's disease. The first one is the enzyme replacement therapy and the other thing is the substrate reduction therapy. 
in enzyme replacement therapy uh, in the simple terms we just replace the defective enzymes genzyme assay uh, developed imiglycerase which is a recombinant gcas uh, enzyme uh, these enzymes are deglycosylated exposing their mannose residues in order to allow their uptake by the macrophages and their transfer into the lysosomes imiglycerase is produced using mammalian cells other option is vela glycerase and it is produced using human fibroblast and the third is the tally glycerase which is produced using carrot cells these products are administered intravenously we have another management option which is the reduction of the substrate so if the substrate is uh, getting reduced there would be less accumulation and then uh, it will downstream there will be less uh, cell death uh, and dysfunction so uh, the aim of this substrate reduction therapy is to reduce uh, excess cell glucosal ceramide by decreasing its production so miglustat uh, is a uh, is a basic is a glucosal ceramide synthetase uh, inhibitor which reduces the synthesis of this glucosal ceramide substrate inside the gaucher cells this is administered orally Another option is the Ellie glu uh, Glustat, which was granted the marketing authorization in 2015. It is also orally administered and is the glucosal ceramide uh, synthetase inhibitor, but is more specific and more potent than Glustat. Other treatment options include uh, gene therapy, uh, molecular chaperones. These chaperones helps in the production of functional enzymes and thus uh, can even restore the intracellular activity of the mutant uh, glucoserbrosidase enzyme. Then we have uh, bone marrow transplantation and uh, uh, another options are just symptomatic support. How do we monitor, uh, monitor and do the prognosis so the biomarker levels like the uh, chitotriosidase ccl18 and ferritin they decrease relatively quickly after the enzyme replacement therapy prior to a normalization of platelet and hemoglobin levels so these three uh, uh, these three enzymes uh, uh, these three uh, components are very important in um, monitoring very early response they uh, get non they get normalized even before the normalization of your thrombocytopenia and anemia so uh, these are quite frequently used uh, decline in hepatosplenomegaly bone uh, bone abnormalities is usually observed after 2 to 4 years of treatment outcomes may be unfavorable due to aggressive irreversible and disabling bone disease if there is onset of parkinson's disease and lewy body dementia or the occurrence of blood diseases or cancer whose relative risk appears to be higher in Gaucher's disease. The outcome is always fatal if it is a type 2 uh, a subtype of Gaucher's disease. So I have covered the Gaucher's disease and in rest of the class I will be dealing with other related lysosomal storage disorders and all of these fall into a common category which is called sphingolipidosis. So let's start with uh, Fabry's disease which is uh, another very important lysosomal storage disorder. So Fabry's disease is a multi-systemic X-linked lysosomal storage diseases caused by decreased activity of alpha galactosidase A results in lysosomal accumulation of neutral glycosphingolipids and globotriosyl ceramide GL3. So abnormalities can occur in almost any part of the body but it has a predisposition to skin, eyes, kidney, heart, brain and peripheral nervous system and predominantly kidney which I'm highlighting is particularly involved in Fabry's disease. Its reported incidence is 1 in 40,000 males and it is one of the rare causes of end-stage renal disease which you have to keep in mind. Deficiency of lysosomal enzyme uh, alpha galactosidase A occurs due to mutation in the GLA gene 
This results in loss of function of the enzyme uh, alpha galactosidase A and hence deposition and accumulation of glycosphingolipids such as globotriosylceramide and its deacetylated uh, derivative globotriosylsphingosin within the lysosome in virtually uh, any cell type uh, be it the capillary endothelial cells, renal cells, cardiac cells and nerve cells. With advancing age, because of this accumulation, there occurs a cascade of events leading to cellular death, inflammation, vascular injury, oxidative stress and ischemia and results in multi-system disorders via progressive damage to these uh, cells. So, Fabry's disease have uh, two important phenotypes. One is the classical phenotype and other is the late onset subtype. So the classical phenotype is characterized by absolutely no alpha galactosidase A enzyme activity. It presents early with a typical symptoms of acroparesthesias, angiokeratomas, hypohydrosis, all the typical symptoms of Fabry's disease, which I'll discuss uh, subsequently during the childhood uh, adolescent age. So that is the classical uh, phenotype. The other is the non-classical form, which is basically presenting in the later onset and includes more of the cardiac and renal involvement and minimal involvement of the other, other organs. So type, uh, the classical type is basically a multi-system disorder, which involves uh, a lot of dermatological, ophthalmological manifestations in addition to the renal and cardiac manifestation but in the non-classical form which presents later with which has some enzyme activity it's not just complete absence of the enzyme activity seen in the classical phenotype the non-classical phenotype usually involves the cardiac and the renal uh, organs uh, with advancing age the progressive deposition of glycosphingolipids leads to progressive multi-system involvement that results in renal failure uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and cerebrovascular disease. The late onset, which is the non-classical form, is typically less severe with a significant residual alpha galactosidase A activity uh, who remain uh, asymptomatic until 4th uh, to 4th to 5th decade of life. So this is a table which highlights different organ systems which are involved in the Fabry's disease. So I'll be dealing with the important ones which are involved in subsequent slides. So uh, first coming to the renal involvement, the Fabry nephropathy, which is called uh, the renal involvement by the Fabry's disease, is a progressive decrease in the renal function with the onset of deposition of globotriosylceramide. And this accumulation can occur in almost all of the renal cells be it the vascular endothelial cells, the smooth muscle cell, the mesangial cells, interstitial cell, podocytes, the tubular epithelial cells. So in all these cells, there is accumulation of this substrate, globotriosylceramide. Uh, eventually, there is increase in microalbuminuria and proteinuria, which are the initial manifestation of the renal impairment. And they can occur as early as 10 years of age or earlier while a decline in glomerular filtration rate is seen starting from adolescence to adolescence in classic patients. So this is a photomicrograph from the kidney biopsy, which shows uh, expansion of the mesangial matrix as well as accumulation of these foam cells. The cardiac involvement is seen in 40 to 60 percent of Fabry's disease patients. The abnormalities include left ventricular hypertrophy, conduction abnormalities, bradycardia, chronotropic incompetence, supraventricular and ventricular tachyarrhythmias, myocardial fibrosis, valve, valvular disease, aortic dil, uh, dilation, and microvascular dysfunction. Heart failure uh, can be seen, uh, which is relatively more common in men compared to women. And myocardial fibrosis is a marker for poor prognosis as associated with increased risk of malignant ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death in these patients. 
nervous system involvement can be seen in the form of small fiber peripheral neuropathy neuropathic pain uh, there can be absence of sweating that is called anhydrosis or decreased ability to sweat which is called hypohydrosis other uh, uh, neurological involvement can be auditory or uh, vestibular abnormalities uh, which uh, results in the range of symptom like uh, hearing loss as well as tinnitus and vertigo there can also be involvement of gi autonomic ganglia which can present as abdominal pain bloating diarrhea constipation nausea and vomiting as well as failure to gain weight the ocular involvement uh, is can be seen as early as during the first decade of life and they include something called cornea uh, verti verticillata which is a whorl like linear pigmentation in the inferior part of the cornea and they are usually visible by a slit lamp microscopy there can be increase in this vessel tortuosity and there is something called fabris cataracts uh, formation of fabris cataract and symptomatic conjunctival telangiectasias and aneurysmal like dilatation of the conjunctival vessels so this is the photograph which shows vascular uh, tortuosity uh, uh, telangiectasia and aneurysmal dilatation uh, in the conjunctival vessels and this is the photograph which depicts fundus examination showing increased uh, retinal vascular tortuosity the skin manifestations are also an important component of fabris disease and they are reported in 78% of males and 50% of females with a classical phenotype and angiokeratoma are the most common dermatological abnormalities they typically appear as clusters of small pinkish dark red blue back non blanching macules or papules ranging in 1 to 5 mm in size on the umbilicus the hands knees elbow trunk and sometimes even in the mucosal areas of the mouth spreading to the genitals during adolescence and in they might increase in number and size so angiokeratoma is the most important skin manifestation so this is a photograph which shows uh, uh, so apart from angiokeratoma what other dermatological uh, manifestation can be seen so there can be a uh, 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 these these telangiectasias which can be present in different mucosal uh, mucosal areas like the conjunctiva the oral mucosa and even in the uh, in the auricle so these are so angiokeratoma and telangiectasias are the important skin manifestation seen in the so just to summarize because the clinical clinical features are extremely important in fabris disease so how a typical patient will present so this uh, this uh, in this uh, uh, table i have just summarized the most important and very classical features of fabris disease so there will always be a family history of these symptoms so that is very important thing to note and uh, in the ophthalmological deposit you can see this cornea verticillata and presence of cataracts there can be anhydrosis and hypohydrosis presence of angiokeratomas acroparesthesias which is basically defined as chronic neuropathic pain and uh, which is superseded by episodic severe pain crisis in distal ex extremities there can be gastrointestinal disturbance unexplained hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, in patients in young uh, uh, in younger patients personal or family history of renal failure end stage renal disease occurring at very young age uh, cryptogenic stroke in patients uh, occurring at uh, before the age of 50 years and there is some uh, family history of intolerance to exercise heat or cold so all these symptoms which uh, for example these cardiac symptoms the renal symptoms the gi symptoms um, um, they when they present at an early stage with a very strong family histories the fabric fabric disease should always be kept in the different diagnosis how we ultimately diagnose these disorders so detecting the deficiency of alpha galactosidase a activity in leukocyte uh, stands as the gold standard for the diagnosis enzyme assay uh, using dried blood spots is generally used for screening 
and a positive result or a negative result is highly suspected uh, in a highly suspected patient should always be confirmed by a second tier test such as uh, measuring the activity of this alpha galactosidase A in leukocytes or by uh, by a genetic test uh, delineating the uh, uh, defective genes. The enzyme levels in classical uh, males is generally below 1% of the normal where, whereas in the non-classical forms which presents later the activity may range from 1 to 20%. The histopathological examination of kidney biopsy samples is of significant importance and they provide evidence for Fabry's disease when genetic testing reveals uh, some new variants which have not been uh, reported earlier, uh, especially the variants of unknown significance. The microalbuminuria, proteinuria, serum creatinine levels are the usual biomarkers for the renal monitoring. Uh, some rarely used biomarkers such as cystatin C, beta-2 microglobulin and neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin or lipocalin-2 creatinine have also been investigated in Fabris disease nephropathy. The utility of amino terminal fragment of brain natriuretic peptide uh, has been confirmed as a diagnostic and pro prognostic predictors of heart disease. So the renal and cardiac involvement are the most important, especially in the non-classical cases and in that apart from the usual biomarkers of these renal and cardiac uh, involvement there have been some newer biomarkers which i have mentioned here which uh, has uh, been uh, uh, under research for their utility as a prognostic predictors the treatment is similar in the lines with gaucher's disease so we have the enzyme replacement therapy and the approved drugs are agal cidase alpha and agal cidase beta. There are some drugs which are still in the investigational stage. Then we have the chaperone therapy in which megalostat is the therapeutic drug which is uh, being used. Apart from that, there have been some research for the management and include uh, utilization of gene therapy and even the substrate reduction therapy similar to the Gaucher's disease. So next, let's move on to another important lysosomal storage disorder, which is the GM1 and GM2 ganglocidosis. Cidosis. The GM1 ganglocidosis uh, is basically due to the lysosomal hydrolase uh, defective uh, enzyme, which is called the beta galactosidase. So this beta galactosidase enzyme, um, which is also known as the GM1 beta galactosidase, it catalyzes the breakdown of GM1. Uh, uh, it catalyzes the breakdown of GM1 ganglioside to GM2. And if there is a defect in this particular enzyme, there is accumulation of this GM1 ganglioidosis. It is again autosomal recessive and neurodegenerative disease uh, with an estimated incidence of 1 in 1 lakh to 2 lakh live births. Any mutation in the GLB1 gene leads to reduced or loss of activity of this beta galactosidase leading to accumulation of lysosomal GM1. Depending on the specific mutation in this GLB1 gene, the residual activity of beta galactosidase differs and it leads to a continuum of clinical severity in these patients. The human beta galactosidase enzyme comprises of three components. One is the beta domain 1, beta domain 2 and the other one is the TIM barrel uh, domain. Uh, any mutation in um, any of these domains leads to decreased activity of beta galactosidase and resulting in the accumulation. Although GM1 is crucial for many neuroprotective purposes, but if it is accumulated in the lysosomes in an extremely massive amount, it stimulates the neuroinflammatory reaction and unfolded protein response. These are mainly in the uh, this has been mainly seen in the mouse models, but have been postulated to be replicated in humans as well. So all this unfolded protein response leads to neuronal death and neurodegeneration. Degeneration. 
GM1 uh, gangliosidosis can be classified into three subtypes. The type 1 which is the infantile, type 2 which is the late infantile or the juvenile and type 3 is the adult form. Type 2 is further categorized as late infantile and juvenile and although no cure of, for the disease is currently available, the chaperone therapy, the substrate reduction therapy, gene therapy have all uh, been uh, are all in the investigational stage, especially in the mouse models. Uh, uh, in the mouse models uh, uh, for this particular disease. So, as I told, there are uh, mainly three subtypes. The type one is the infantile. Type two is divided into late infantile and the juvenile form. And type 3 is basically the adult form. The type 1 is the type 1 mainly present in um, very early stage, the four, uh, about 4 to 6 months, and they present with hypotonia, cherry red macules, hepatosplenomegaly, schizers, Mongolian spots, and usually it is very severe form with death occurring in 2 to 4 years of life. The type 2 is further categorized as late infantile form and juvenile form. The late infantile form usually presents, uh, up, uh, usually presents after one year of life. Uh, till one year, there is normal neurological development. After one year, there is some psychomotor regression. The child is unable to walk. There is unstable gait. There is some abnormalities in the speech. And again, there is strabismus, schizers. Uh, oromotor dysfunction, skeletal abnormalities and death usually occurs by second decade of life. Whereas the juvenile type, another form uh, which is the juvenile subtype, the normal development occurs until three to five years of age and then uh, the uh, abnormalities start uh, presenting in the form of stuttering or progressive dysarthria, gait instability, variable skeletal diseases, uh, uh, with some uh, developing avascular necrosis of the femoral head. Uh, there are presence of seizures, atypical seizures and survival uh, can occur up to fourth decade in some patients. So this is relatively a milder form compared to type 1 and type 2 late infantile form. Type 3 is the adult form and it presents as cerebellar dysfunction, slowly progressive dementia, dysarthria, dystonia, there will be uh, mild vertebral anomalies and they are mainly uh, described in uh, patients with Japanese. The GM2 subtype of gangliosidosis is also autosomal recessive. It is also a neurodegenerative disease caused by defects in the machinery, which is responsible for the GM2 degradation which leads to accumulation of this GM2 and other related lipids in the neural cells. So both GM1 and GM2 uh, gangliosidosis mainly involve the neurological abnormalities uh, in all of the subtypes that I have described for GM1 uh, and also for GM2 as well. So normally GM2 is degraded by the coordinated action of lysosomal beta and acetyl hexosaminidases or simply the beta hexosaminidases uh, which removes the terminal N-acetyl galactosamine residues from GM2 and, and the ancillary protein GM2A. So beta hexosaminidase has two hydrolytic subunits, the alpha and beta, which are encoded by hex A and hex B gene. Uh, and different composition combinations of these hydrolytic subunits uh, form distinct isoenzymes, which have different substrate specificities. And these uh, basically form the basis of different GM2 gangliosidosis that we see. So uh, if there is a defect in uh, uh, something called hex A gene that is the uh, uh, involving the alpha subunit, we have something called Tay-Sachs disease, which is also called as B variant. Okay. And if there is uh, the affected gene is hex B, then there is will be defect in the beta subunit of the disease 
and we will have something called Sandoff disease, which is called the ovariant disease. So hex A and hex B, these form the alpha and the beta subunit respectively. And the alpha and beta subunit are normally the important two important subunits of this beta hexosaminidase enzyme. So if there is a defect in the alpha subunit, it is called the Tay-Sachs disease. If there is a defect in beta subunit, then it is called the Sandoff disease. And we have another variant in which uh, basically there is defect in not in the enzyme but in the activator protein. And that is called the AB variant or GM2 activator deficiency. Okay. So we have the, uh, so among the GM2 gangliosidosis, again, we have the Tay-Sachs disease, we have the Sandoff disease, and we have the GM2 activator deficiency as we had seen in the Gaucher's disease in the form of Saposin C. So uh, beta hexose aminidase A deficiency emerges from a biallelic null or missense mutation in the genes hex A or hex B, which codes for the alpha and beta subunit. So whenever there is a defect in either of these subunit, there is misfolded or missing enzyme leads to accumulation of GM2 gangliocide, which is a substrate for this enzyme. And this GM2 gangliocide is mainly uh, uh, accumulated within the neuronal cells. The pathophysiology wise, uh, the GM2 gangliosides and their accumulated components cause neuroinflammation and other secondary effects leading to swollen demyelinated neurons of mainly the central but can, they can also involve the peripheral nervous system. The GM2 gangliosidosis involve dysfunction on multiple cell types, the microglial cells, the neurons, the oligodendroglial cells. So any of these important cell cells of the nervous system can be uh, involved due to the accumulation of this GM2 gangliosidosis. So uh, for uh, microglial cells, there can be abnormal synaptic pruning and microglial hemostatic signals. There can be a release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which leads to induction of necroptosis of, on other cell types. Within the neurons, uh, there can be uh, accumulation within the membranous cytoplasmic bodies. The zebra bodies and fingerprint inclusions can be seen. There can be oxidative stress and ultimately apoptosis and cell death. Um, there, will, there can be demyelination uh, due to involvement of these oligodendroglial cells, which is the myelinating cells, and this leads to secondary axonal degeneration and retrograde neuronal cells. The residual enzyme activity determines the disease onset, symptoms, and progression, which has led to categorization into different uh, subtypes. So we have the infantile onset, juvenile onset, and the late onset seen in the in the infantile onset, there is uh, usually uh, the symptoms present as early as three to six months in the form of hypotonia, cherry red macules, delayed developmental milestones, seizures, and macrocephaly. Death usually occurs by three to five years of age. In the juvenile form, the development uh, there is a later presentation uh, in the form of ataxia, dysarthria, dysphagia, and seizures. Death occurs in the early twenties. In the adult form, ataxia and there is presence of increased falls, neurogenic weakness, dysarthria. Uh, there is, a, however, preserved cognition, but overall the lifespan is decreased. MRI imaging is also uh, characteristic and different in all these three uh, subtypes. For example, the classical uh, MRI finding in infantile form is the presence of macrocephaly. In the juvenile form, there is global atrophy. And in the late onset, cerebellar atrophy is classically seen. A cherry red spot uh, is a characteristic feature uh, in the infantile GM2 gangliosidosis and it is less commonly seen in, uh, with juvenile and later onset subtypes. Coming to the next entity which is called the Krabs disease. Uh, the Krabs lysosomal storage disorder, which is also called as globoid cell leukodystrophy. It is characterized by defective uh, galactosyl ceramide beta galactosidase, which is called GAL-C uh, enzyme, 
So the GALSI uses a help of its activator SAP A and SAP C to remove the substrate galactose from its primary substrate uh, galactose, uh, galactoseramide and other secondary uh, galactose containing sphingolipids. Uh, for example, galacto, uh, galactosyl sphingosyl. In Krabs disease, it is believed that it is not the primary substrate that is the galactosyl ceramide which gets accumulated into the central nervous system because it is usually degraded by other hydrolytic enzymes in the CNS. Instead, it is the psychosin which is a major accumulating product within the lysosome of these patients. The psychosin as such is cytotoxic substance that causes demyelination by triggering the disintegration of the oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells and other uh, the Schwann cells which are mainly the myelin formation uh, forming cells within the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system and ultimately leads to uh, apoptosis and cell death. So it is important to this to keep in mind that it is the psychosin and not the classical galactosyl ceramide which is involved in the uh, which is the main component involved in the pathogenesis of Krabs disease. Beside demyelination, Krabs disease causes infiltration of large multinucleated macrophages and perivascular microglia, which forms the globoid cells, engorged with undigested storage sphingolipids in the white matter. This is accompanied by astrogliosis and pro-inflammatory cytokine dysregulation. Although there is currently no effective therapy for Krabs disease, recent gene therapy approaches in the animal models have indicated a promising outlook for clinical treatment. Loss of myelin is seen uh, in the uh, in the cerebrum, except in some intergyral arcuate U fibers. Apart from that, uh, this is the photomicrograph which shows accumulation of PS positive globoid cells. Uh, there will be loss of oligodendrocytes and uh, resulting in demyelination, and also there will be presence of gliosis. So uh, again, as with other uh, lysosomal storage disorder, their Krabs disease is also uh, divided among the three subgroups, the infantile, juvenile, and the adult onset. So the infantile presents early with neurological deterioration, progressive neurological deterioration, uh, psychomotor regression, loss of vision, hearing, and voluntary movements. Survival is up to two years. The late infantile form uh, usually have a slower progression and they survive till 9, uh, nine to 10 years. The juvenile onset uh, has uh, shown variable progression uh, and they usually survive longer than 16 years. The adult onset after 15 years, they have a variable progression. They uh, usually uh, uh, present with variable neurological uh, dysfunction and they have a longer survival. The next disease that we will discuss is called metachromatic leukodystrophy. Dystrophy. So uh, metachromatic leukodystrophy is again an autosomal recessive lysosomal storage disorder with an incidence of 1 per 40,000 to 1 in 1 lakh 60,000 live birth. Metachromatic leukodystrophy is uh, caused by deficiency of aryl sulfatase A enzyme and sphingolipid activator protein B uh, uh, component as a consequence of mutation in AR, uh, ARSA and PSAP genes. Metachromatic leukodystrophy is characterized by accumulation of sulfatides and related glycolipids in the lysosomes. Because sulfatides are present mainly in the white matter of the brain and peripheral nervous system, forming the myelin sheet, sulfatide accumulation predominantly causes demyelination. Secondarily, a cytotoxic sulfatide derivative, which is called the lysosulfatide, also uh, is thought to play a role in the pathogenesis of the disease. Based again, based on the age of onset, there are three forms which has been described, late infantile, juvenile and form. So late infantile usually have a survival less than 2.5 years, uh, the, uh, whereas the adult have usually survival more than 16 years. The infantile form usually presents with uh, a motor phenotype, 
the as the age increases the cognitive phenotype the behavioral changes learning difficulties and psychiatric problems are mainly seen in the adult uh, adult variant so this is a uh, kind of a summary slide for metachromatic leukodystrophy diagnosis so the first uh, test is uh, using uh, the which is called the biochemical test it is basically uh, to diagnose the aryl sulfatase enzyme activity in the leukocytes the uh, diagnosis of metachromatic leukodystrophy uh, cannot exclusively be based on uh, the enzyme activity it is because there is something called presence of pseudo deficiency alleles in the population so in the case of pseudo deficiency alleles the aryl sulfatase a activity is uh, still low but they do not these patients do not have any symptoms so if you just measure the aryl sulfatase enzyme uh, activity so these pseudo deficiency can uh, leads to false positive results so for that to uh, overcome that we have something called urinary sulfatides level so these urinary sulfatides level can be diagnosed with the help of hplc mass spectrometry or thin layer chromatography and sulfatide excretion is normal in case of pseudo deficiency alleles but they can be increased um, in case of the real uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the true positive cases uh, of uh, aryl sulfatase uh, deficiency then we have the molecular genetic test for mrsa gene uh, there are over 150 mutation that has been reported and two mutation which occur more frequently Uh, uh, which are associated with the late infantile onset and other uh, which is mainly found in the adult form so the two mutations are more common uh, apart from that there are some rarer mutations which has been described then we can do brain or nerve biopsy and uh, lastly diffuse symmetric abnormalities of uh, periventricular myelin with hyper intensities on t2 weighted images can also be utilized Uh, initial posterior involvement is observed uh, in most late infantile cases with subcortical u fibers and cerebellar white matters are usually so this is a photograph uh, which uh, shows the kluver ps staining so this a photograph is from the normal uh, control uh, control uh, control individual and the b photograph is from the patient with metachromatic leukodystrophy so as you can see uh the normal the myelin is usually stained with blue uh which is decreased in this uh in this particular photograph uh the bluish uh, the bluish myelin is decreased uh within this uh, patient in in a patient with uh, metachromatic leukodystrophy and also this inset which shows uh, enlarged macrophages accumulating the sulfa tides and this c photograph just depicts uh, the photomicrograph from the cerebellum which is usually spared so here you can see the normal bluish myelin uh, um, um, staining and that in a cerebellum which is usually spared in the metachromatic leukodystrophy at present there is no curative treatment available for all patients with metachromatic leukodystrophy and hematopoietic stem cell transplant gene therapy and enzyme replacement therapy which are in lines of other lysosomal storage disorders have also been extensively tested in mouse model for this disease as well so uh, there has been different approaches that are in research either in the form of alteration of the gene or gene product in the form of gene silencing gene editing and gene delivery there can be uh, arrest in the gene prog uh, arrest in the disease progression in the form of uh, stem cell transplant and also uh, finally uh, there have been research to restore what is damaged in the form of neural stem cells oligodendrocytes progenitor cells etc the last disease that we will discuss today is called neiman pick disease yes. neiman pick disease is broadly categorized as type a b and c 
type A and B affect 1 in 250,000 individuals uh, and is relatively more commoner in Ashkenazi Jewish population where it affects 1 in 40,000 individuals whereas type C affects 1 in 1,50,000 persons. The, uh, the Neiman pick disease is usually inherited as autosomal recessive pattern. The type A and B Type A and B are due to mutation in SMPD1 gene and this uh, are categorized uh, as type A when, the, when there is complete absence of the enzyme and type B when there is some enzyme which is remaining. And type C is ba basically due to mutations in NPC1 and NPC2 gene. So this slide again highlights the important uh, broad classifications of neiman pick's disease so neiman pick's disease can be due to either acid sphingomyelinase deficiency or impaired cholesterol esterification uh, when acid sphingomyelinase deficiency is there uh, we have uh, further subtypes which is called uh, npd type a and npd type b based on different gene defects and uh, then we have uh, in type C, we have C1 and C2 gene defect leading to uh, impaired cholesterol esterification. Neiman Pick's disease type A and B are caused due to mutation in sphingomyelin, sphingomyelin phosphodiesterase 1 gene that is SMPD1 gene leading to strongly decreased activity of acid sphingomyelinase enzyme. Uh, this particular enzyme is mainly present in lysosomes and they convert the sphingomyelin to ceramide and phosphocholine. So type A neiman picks disease patient exhibit hepatosplenomegaly and failure to thrive within first year of life because they have complete absence of this acid sphingomyelinase enzyme. A cherry red spot is present in macula in almost 50% of these patients. The disease is characterized by rapidly progressive neurodegenerative course with profound hypotonia and failure to attain milestones. And most of these patients do not survive beyond the third year of life. Type B, on the other hand, we have some residual uh, acid sphingomyelinase enzyme activity. They do not have overt sign of CNS involvement, but can have hepatosplenomegaly, which may be which can be profound with signs of liver failure. Serum triglycerides and LDL cholesterol can be elevated, and these are usually seen in a younger patient. So, uh, abnormal lipid profile in a younger patient should always raise a concern of neiman Pick's disease. The lungs are frequently involved in type B uh, neiman Pick's disease and pulmonary function is usually compromised in these patients. There may also be a reddish brown halo surrounding the macula in the eyes of these patients and in some cases a distinct cherry red spot can also be identified similar to type A. Because insufficient enzyme activity is the hallmark for type A and B neiman Pick disease, the obvious first diagnostic step is to quantify these uh, enzyme activity in a convenient cells like circulating leukocytes or cultured skin fibroblast. The, uh, this uh, can be followed by a confirmatory test in the form of sequencing of the involved gene, um, but should also but should not be used as a first line diagnostic indicator, which is always the uh, uh, which is always the quantification of the enzyme activity. The presence of vacuolated cells in peripheral blood smears or bone marrow is also a indicator of the disease but to be specific here that it cannot be used as a diagnostic marker because the these kind of cells can be seen in other disease uh, and other diseases as well. The dried blood spot enzymatic assays also have been recently developed to detect both type A and type B neiman pick disease. Photomicrograph shows accumulation of these uh, cells, these large cells with bubbly cytoplasm, which is also called the foam cells. There can be other causes of foam cells which we have to keep in uh, keep in our mind, and it's just not the Neiman Pick's disease. So these foam cells can be seen in hereditary cholesterolemias, even in Fabry's disease, Wallman's disease 
post trauma uh, during fat necrosis as well as pancreatitis coming to type c which is a unique uh, subtype so it is further classified as c1 or c2 based on pathogenic uh, mutation in npc1 and npc2 gene so the loss of function of npc1 and npc2 protein blocks the cholesterol egress from the lysosomes resulting in its accumulation and excessive build up of the cholesterol within the lysosomes and consequently this toxic cholesterol accumulation results in uh, cellular and uh, end organ damage uh, this neiman pick's disease type c is a slowly progressive disorder whose principal manifestations are usually age dependent the manifestation in the perinatal period and infancy are predominantly visceral with hepatosplenomegaly jaundice and pulmonary infiltrates from late infancy onwards the presentation is dominated by neurological manifestation the youngest child uh, the youngest children may present with hypotonia developmental delay with subsequent emergence of ataxia dysarthria dysphagia and in some individuals epileptic seizures dystonia and gelastic cataplexy can also be seen although cognitive impairment may be subtle at first it eventually becomes more apparent in the later stages and the patient can have progressive dementia so uh, this is just to highlight uh, the uh, the involvement in type c uh, neiman pick's disease so uh, the usually the uh, hepatosplenomegaly is uh, can be absent in 15% of the cases and uh, may even regress with age the involvement of hepatosplenomegaly whereas the other neurological uh, components can uh, be the front runner in these in this subtype with a motor uh, with delay in motor milestones presenting earlier in with hypotonia then there can be gait abnormalities clumsiness speech uh, abnormalities cataplexy and as the individual grow there can be psychiatric issues uh, dementia ataxia and uh, other important abnormalities uh, vertical supranuclear gaze palsy is something which can be seen Uh, uh throughout the uh, age of onset so this is something to be kept in mind uh, as one of the important uh, clinical manifestation so in presence of uh, certain clinical clues uh, we can always follow this particular algorithm to diagnose neiman pick's disease type c mm -hmm. so whenever there is uh, certain uh, clinical manifestations that i have discussed previously Uh, and as well as certain uh, laboratory clues to uh, for neiman pick disease type c we can always go for a skin biopsy and fibroblast culture and do something called philippin test so what is philippin philippin is a polyne antibiotic that binds specifically to the cholesterol but to uh, only its unesterified form and not to its uh, esterified sterols so it detects only the free or unesterified cholesterol in the biological membranes and hence uh, its visualization uh, depicts increased number of unesterified cholesterol uh, within the lysosomes so if this uh, philippin test uh, which is ideally done twice is highly positive then we can all we can nearly be sure that it's we are dealing with neiman pick's disease type c and we can do a confirmatory test with sequencing of both these genes uh, if there is some moderate positivity or there is some uh, positivity which is difficult to interpret we can always go for a probable or a variant or a type of uh, neiman pick's disease type c and we can do uh, something called kinetics of ldl induced cholesterol ester formation this if positive can further uh, be uh, confirmed by again sequencing of npc 1 and 2 gene uh if uh, this philippin test is uh, clearly negative then we can be reasonably be sure that we are not dealing with uh, neiman pick's disease type c and we have we can search for other differential diagnosis so this is basically uh, what a philippin test looks like so a is from one of the patient from npc type 1 and b is from npc type 2 and here you can see this uh, philippin is getting highlighted as being 
uh, accumulated within the cells and these basically these uh, mainly binds the unesterified cholesterol so both of these pictures shows increased accumulation of unesterified cholesterol so this slide highlights the treatment modalities that can be used for uh, human disease type C uh, which includes chaperone therapy which boosts the residual NPC protein function, the gene therapy and the bone marrow transplant which corrects the primary gene and protein defect, the antioxidant, anti-apoptotic agents and anti-inflammatory agents which enhance cells resistance to the disease, drugs that alter the vesicular trafficking uh, which bypass the blockage of the enzyme the H, uh, the miclostat, which reduces the cholesterol or glycosphingolipids, which is a substrate reducing therapy conventionally, uh, conventionally used in different lysosomal storage disorder. And also the curcumin, which alters the lysosomal homeostasis to improve the uh, inherent function of these lysosomes. That is the end of my presentations. I have uh, dealt with uh, very briefly dealt with mainly uh, the sphingolipidosis, the Gaucher's disease and other related lysosomal uh, storage disorder. I've tried to focus mainly on the most important and characteristic features of each disease entities because there can be a lot of overlap in the diagnosis as well as the treatment and in the presentation. Most of these lysosomal storage disorder tend to uh, uh, tend to affect the neurological uh, uh, neurological function so uh, but there are certain clues uh, which I have highlighted in this presentation which can help you to uh, 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 specifically delineate certain or exclude certain uh, uh, related uh, related lysosomal storage disorder thank you